Is everyone here? I, th I feel like there are less people today. <laughs> are there still people uh, eating upstairs? No? OK, very good. So uh, very good, pretty good, yeah. Uh, OK, very good. So let's get started. So. Here is a summary of uh, some of the things that uh, we have seen so far. So right now, we are having this picture where we are studying S matrices. And uh, the simplest possible case is the case where we have ultra local potentials. That's what's written there at the end. In that case, we, we are looking at a space of functions that for real values of k, uh, are phases, absolute value of S is equal to one. If there were other outcomes, they would be smaller or equal than one, but it's equal to one because it's the only outcome. And then in the upper half plane, there could be zeros. But zeros we don't care, typically, but sometimes they have a physical interpretation as resonances, and I'm going to explain that next. And there could be poles, and poles are bound states, and they are very physical and very important. And the residue of the poles, we think of it as the strength of the coupling of the external particles to the bound state. How tight is the bound state is related to the strength of that residue. OK? And so we have bound states. The bound states manifest themselves as poles with positive residue. And we can have zeros as well. And some zeros are interpreted as resonances. At infinity, there's no essential singularity. If the potential is local, it's exactly the same picture, with the difference that at infinity, there is a e to the minus 2 ika essential singularity at infinity, right? Where the potential goes from minus a to a. OK? Finally, if we have a potential that decays exponentially as e to the minus x over a, so it also has a finite range a, but of exponential type. So strictly speaking, it has infinite support. The picture is similar, except that there is a line which, when a is small, is very big, which is imaginary part of k equal 1 over 2a. And above this line, uh, there can be dragons, as we normally say. I mean, there can be a priori, it's hard to control, because there you lose control over what happens. Okay. Sometimes. You don't. Sometimes you can solve the problem exactly, like we did last time. That's where we saw these fake poles. But often case, you will not be able to solve. And then that's the dangerous region. OK? So again, let me just, yeah, let, let me open a small parenthesis and say, and tell you a fun exercise that I thought this morning that I want to do, but I didn't have time to do yet. But it should be cool to see. So what we did here was we said that v, if v is e to the minus absolute value of x over a, then we said that our wave function was equal to something like f of 0 g of x, f prime of 0 g of x minus g prime of 0 f of x, where these guys here were some I Bessel functions, right? This was just to make sure the function is even. And from this, we extracted the asymptotics. We got an S matrix that had some strange poles above this line, and they, they were these fake poles, right? You agree? And you remember that this combination was just to ensure that the function is uh, even. Right? Now, let's suppose we solve a potential which is equal to this times a step function of b squared minus x squared. That is, I put a potential that is exponential, and then at some point I put it to 0 exactly. Right? So physically, it should not matter much. right? So if I have exponential that decays very much, all I'm doing is saying, OK, at this point, I put it equal to 0. Right? And the, the new potential is this one here. I erase this tail. 
Now, if B is much bigger than A, it should be more or less the same physics, right? I'm just cutting off a little bit of an exponential tail. OK, can we solve this problem? Well, of course, right? Now, the wave function, let's write it. It would be this times some function, A of k, if x is smaller than b. And it would be psi equal e to the minus ikx plus s of k e to the ikx for x bigger than b. Outside the potential, it's just now we are back to a case of the previous type that we studied. And now we could recompute the S matrix. How do we compute the S matrix? By matching function and derivative here. Right? So now, here, by matching psi and psi prime match, we impose that they match and we get A of k and we get S of k from these two conditions. Right? And now, this S matrix should be very similar to the previous one, but there should be no dragons. Right? This S matrix, all the poles should be true. So all the fake poles should disappear for this S matrix. Okay. Uh, and otherwise, it should be very similar. So it should be an S matrix, very, very close, similar, right? if B is similar. And then when we reach this dragon region, it should fix the problems of the previous S matrix. Yeah. This sounds like a fun exercise to do. I never did it, but. Okay, for this guy, there are no dragons. It would be nice to do a contour plot of this S matrix versus the one we saw last time and see that they are very similar. This one cannot have poles, but it's very similar. So it will have some bumps, but they will not be poles. They will be just some big bumps. But it, we will have solved the problems. And so this is something you could, in principle, do. If you have some potential, and you are a little bit worried, and you know that, who cares, the physics A is more or less here, and I, put, I just shut it off at 10A, that probably is a good trick. Anyway, this is a parenthesis. I never did this exercise. I think it must work. Yes? So, uh, you turn a potential into another potential too, yeah. but the physics here is very different, even though the potentials are similar. So, what? No, if the physics, of course, if I cut off the potential here, the physics is very different. The idea is that this is very small, so probably it doesn't make a difference. There are bound states, and the other is not bound states. No, 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 the bound states will be the same. So the new S matrix will have, what will happen for this S matrix? It will have poles very, very close to these poles. The poles will be almost at the same location. But these fake poles in this region will, have, will be gone. This fake region disappears, and if there were true poles here, they will now show, show up as poles, and we'll be able to see them. Right? I mean, if you have an exponential potential, right, with a typical length scale A, and you say that at A square, <laughs> I make it equal to zero, who cares, right? I mean, there the potential is really exponentially small, so I think it should be okay. The fake poles won't be true poles on the other Right. Uh, there, the fake poles will disappear. But fake poles were bad, right? They were not bound states. They were an artifact. Now they will be gone. Yes. Again, this is something I, I did not do, and I did not see anywhere. So I just thought of it in the metro coming here. So <laughs> I think it will work. But if you see a flaw in this reasoning, you, you should, it, there might exist. It might be. I see a problem, because look for this derivative. How can I put? the derivative continuous in this case, because in a general case, I can have a continuous derivative. For example, here is very clear that the derivative will not be continuous. No, that's wrong. The derivative is continuous. Yeah. Schrodinger equation with uh, the derivative is continuous even if the potential is not continuous, right? I mean, the derivative is continuous for the well, right? The derivative here is continuous and the function is continuous. It's, uh, that's just wrong. In no, this my, my, situation, yeah. mm -hmm. in this situation we will fix infinite bound states. No, for sure, no. no, no, but no. Because the S function had infinite bound states, but they were, some of them used, were bad. So no, 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 not some of them were bad. The infinite tower was bad. Yeah, so they, and then there were a finite amount of yeah, them. Yeah, but if we don't have the dragon region, and we have the same S matrix? No, similar S matrix. 
It will be very similar here because this is the low energy physics and the low energy physics is the same. The high energy region in the complex plane will be different and it will be fixed. All these poles that are here will disappear. All these fake poles. It will just, they, they will probably be small bumps or something, but they will disappear. You can put B as far away as you want and the, the potential to be quite the same. So you yeah. expect that the poles on these two potentials would be the same. So the fake poles. No, but they, but they are, they, they could be the same if B goes through. Okay. Do the exercise. I did not do it. <laughs> do it. It's easier. It's trivial. I, you can do, yeah. I'll do it in five minutes if you give me a computer, right? I just. <laughs> there is Bessel functions, equate this, and why all this philosophy, blah, 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 maybe this, maybe that. Just do it and see. Okay. Do it and plot along the imaginary axis, the function, and tell me what you see. So, Phil, you mentioned that we won't have, uh, we don't do this trick. Uh -huh. Can we have the dragons, okay? Yes. Uh, these dragons have some physical interpretation or are just bad things that we cannot do nothing about this? Uh, I can I think the short answer, I think they are bad things. Maybe sometimes, no. But uh, for example, in the example we saw, it was just an equally spaced set of infinite number of bound states going all the way to minus infinity. Okay. I think that's just nonsense. Okay. Um, any other questions? That's what I'm saying. You do this and you will find the real bound states. Uh, I just, <laughs> this is the solution, I think. Uh, uh, this will give you the correct solution. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, resonances. So let's suppose we consider the following potential. It's this potential. Now, this potential is always positive, right? There are no bound states, right? Potential has no bound states. You agree? It's a positive potential, it has no bound states. We send some wave, and there is some scattering state. There is a mass matrix, S of K, for this potential. And this S of K will have no poles in the upper half plane. So that's true. There are no bound states. Uh, before, I can OK. There are no bound states. However, this is like a box here inside, right? So we know that if I, if I have a box, I can put something here. I mean, it doesn't escape, right? It just <laughs> it gets stuck there. So there should be something like a bound state. I should be able to put stuff here that uh, is more or less stuck there. Right? So in particular, let me note that if you look at this part here of the potential, right? And if I were to transform this part into just this potential, right, where I, uh, this part is this part, this part is this part, of course here, there are bound states. Right? Right? So if this is some V0 and this is some V0, then, depending on V0 and depending on A, there are a bunch of bound states here, right? Like this, and then uh, like this, etc. There are a bunch of bound states, the ones that we saw the other day. And these bound states should be possible to more or less put them there, right? So there should, it should be more or less possible to put them there. So let me tell you what you see in a cartoon, in a comic book style, if you start scattering waves in this potential at different energies. So you start sending waves 
And we are going to be plotting the wave function as a function of the distance. Let's mark this point being A and this point being B, where this is A and this is B. And let's plot this wave function as we scatter at different energies. So let's start with some small energy. Like we start with small energy here. And this is what you see if you plot the wave function. The correct plots are in a, no. Sorry, what does you get is something like this. Something like this. If, then the better pictures are in, um, in, um, in the notes. And what we see, this would be, if I put some numbers, I can give you some realistic, I can tell you some parameters there. So, okay. So for uh, the only parameter missing here, just if you want to reproduce it yourself here, is v in. So for example, I was doing some plots for v in equal 10, this v0 equal 20, a equal 1, b equal 1.2, and that's it. Then we start with some momentum k equal 5.6, and we get something like this. Then we go, we, do, we redo the same plot. Let me put these lines here. And we redo the same plot for k equal 5.8, and we get something similar. Then we redo the same plot for k equal 6.01, and we get something totally different. We get the wall, and we get the, and then some small oscillations here. Then we continue, and we draw something for k equals 6.1, say. And we get something, again, like we were seeing before. And then we continue, and later we do k equal, okay, some other k, that I forgot which, because I got some wrong, okay, this one. And we get some nice thing like this, and then some small oscillations again. Okay, so I got all these numbers uh, wrong. This was k equal 4.6. And this was k equals 6.01, and all these numbers are different. But okay, some smaller values, okay, you can check in the, in the notes. 4.2, 4.7, no, 4.5, whatever. But the point is, there are some values that you pass by, and when you pass by these values, the wave function is huge inside the box and very small outside. Okay? So what's happening? What's happening is that there are some, some energies that you are scattering, which would correspond to the energies where you would have a bound state in this potential. That's the energy where the particle would like to be trapped here. So you are passing by these values, which are the values where if you adjust that k, and if you see what k it is, and if you adjust to this original problem, you would be able to put a bound state there. And so what's happening is that, of course, there is, strictly speaking, no bound state. There is some oscillations. Then the wave function is huge here, and it, what's happening is that it, it prefers to be here. If you try to detect it, you will mostly detect it inside the box. Right? But if you wait a long time, and if you do time evolution, it comes in, spends a long time in the box, and eventually it leaks out. Okay? And that's what a resonance is. It's an unstable particle. Yes, you can put it in the box. If the width of the box is very big, it will stay in the box. Otherwise, it goes there, stays in the box for a long time, and then decays. So if you were to plot something like the amount of wave function, the amount of psi inside the box, 
How would you do it? I mean, some integral of psi inside the box divided by some integral of psi in a length of, say, 10 times the size of the box, some, some quantity that gives you. What would you find? You would find something small and then some peak, and then small and then some peak, and then small and then some peak. Right? And this is how you detect particles. Right? This would be a detection of a particle. You say, oh, phew, this peak is like an unstable particle. Then the other peak is another unstable particle. Right? So that's how people detect particles. If you look at the plot of the Higgs, it's the same. There are, and then a bump, and that's the Higgs. So this, it's a slightly more complicated experiment, but it's more or less this. Okay? So this is, this is what we would normally call a particle. All, I mean, most particles in nature are unstable, so they are resonances, and that's what we see. We see some particles that stay in the box for some time, and then they leak out. And the, the more, the bigger is the energy, the easier it is for the, for the particle to leak out. So these peaks will become smaller and smaller, indicating that they are more, less and less stable. And it's harder and harder to keep them in the box as the energy is bigger. OK? Now, um, the claim is that if you compute the S matrix, and you can compute the S matrix, you will find that this, these guys, these energies, this case where there are these peaks are precisely at, the, at this value where the function has zeros. Okay? So the zeros are precisely where you have these peaks and where the wave function likes to be inside. So to see it more explicitly, let's work out a particular example. I like this example because it looks like a box. But there is a simpler example where we can do things much more analytical. That's also a reasonable box, right? You take the case where this is very thin and very tall, very thin and very tall. It's a, a particular type of box with two delta functions. So that's an example where we want to see these poles explicitly. So let's solve the case where the potential V is mu, or maybe mu over 2, delta function of x minus a, plus mu over 2, delta function of x plus a. So the potential, it has some delta function, and then another delta function. And we'll take mu to be positive. So no bound states. So this S matrix has no poles. Well, we can solve it, right? Here the wave function is cosine. Here it's two plane waves. We don't equate the function in the derivative, but we know the discontinuity of the, of the derivative now because it's a delta function. We solve the S matrix, and we find very easily the S matrix. And the S matrix is given by a very trivial expression, which is this, k minus i um, mu, let me remove the over 2 so that I don't put typos, and then 1 plus e to the minus 2i k a over 2. And then the same thing, the complex conjugate, k plus i mu, 1 plus e to the plus 2 i k a over 2. Okay. First trivial check. Let's check what happens when a goes to 0. When a goes to 0, this becomes 2, this becomes 2, 2 over 2 is 1, and we get k minus i mu over k plus i mu, which is the same as the S matrix for the delta function. And up to a factor of 2, but a factor of 2 is just because when a equals to 0, we get 2 mu instead of mu. That's why I put mu over 2, but okay, no, no, let's keep it like this. Okay, good. So this S matrix has the good a to 0 limit. Let's see something, uh, something nice. You see that uh, first, when uh, k is very big and imaginary, this term dominates. So this is the famous essential singularity. So here it is again, as usual. So another example where we made a prediction that if the potential is finite range, this is case B, in the particular case where we have two delta functions, indeed, that's the essential singularity we get at infinity. So here it is in another one more example. But what we want to look at are the poles. So let's look at the, the, the poles 
of this factor, which, as we know, correspond to zeros of this factor. So, yeah. The essential polarity will always be e to the minus two i k a, and for every potential, or is it just on these two? No, yeah, it's always, always like this. If this is a, if this is two a, then it's always e to the minus two k a. It's universal. This is exactly the example, right? This is two a. So, <clears throat> so let's look at these poles when mu is large. Because when mu is large, it's precisely when the delta functions are big, and we expect to be able to put bound states here in the middle. Right? We have these two big walls, and we can put some stationary states here. So if mu is large, right? if mu is large, we see that there are the uh, poles. Yeah. If mu is large, there are poles at values approximately equal to e to the 2i k a equal to minus 1. Right? If mu is very big, the poles are more or less at this location, right? Plus a small correction that you can and you are encouraged to compute. It's one of the exercises. And that means that the poles are at k equal to uh, to i a k equal to pi plus 2 pi n. Right? This is the approximate location. And what is this? This is, of course, just the usual quantization. If I put a particle here and I get this, this is the first state, and then uh, there is the uh, second state, or whatever, I have to draw it, and all these quantized states are at this quantized moment. Okay? Now, these are not exactly there. The correct location is k is approximately equal to this minus i over 2a pi plus 2 pi n. Oh, no, there is no. Sorry, here there is an i. So 1 over this value, and then minus i times some small imaginary part. So the, the, the picture in the complex plane is precisely this picture. There are a bunch of poles, and correspondingly zeros in the upper half plane, whose location is approximately where you would put the stationary states. Now, the more energetic they are, the further away they are from the real line, which means that the, um, the less stable they are. And, uh, and that is the physical picture. So in the notes, I don't know if you can see from here, but I'm not going to draw. There is, here is a contour plot of the function. Can you see more or less from here? There are a bunch of points. And this is the same contour plot. There are a bunch of points. But here there is some garbage up and down. You can probably not see. You can see in the notes. I can describe it by words. If you do the contour plot, there are a bunch of poles. Boom, 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 boom. And then as you go to I infinity, it also explodes. That explosion is just the essential singularity. If you divide by the essential singularity, then for the new function, you get just the poles boom, 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 appearing in a nice location, and then nothing at infinity or the zeros in this case. And so the physical picture that we have uh, is, uh, is complete now. So if we have particles that are almost stable particles, but not exactly stable particles, they are resonances. Most particles in nature are resonances. The Higgs is a, an example. It, uh, it decays, so it, it's a resonance. It's not really a bound state but it shows up as a peak uh, in scattering amplitudes, exactly like there. These resonances, if they are there, they will show up as zeros relatively close to the real line. Poles will show up as poles in the imaginary axis. Right? And uh, in the dragon region, there could be poles that are not bound states. And everywhere else, there can not, it's not guaranteed that all zeros have meaning of uh, resonances. Right? So we show that if there are resonances, they will typically show up as zeros. 
But it's much harder to say that if you have zeros, especially if they are far away in the complex plane, that they need to have a physical meaning. And in general, they don't. If, if your S matrix far away in the complex plane has some zeros, that, that's, uh, that's okay. It, it doesn't have, you can say, some people say, it's a broad resonance, but it, it means very little. Okay. Sometimes it's, it, 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 people fight. I mean, is this a particle? Is it a resonance? But okay. it typically is a particle, but when it's very far away, who knows if there are more zeros there. No one would call them particles anymore. They would be too unstable. Yeah. Uh, are, are they the same particles? These zeros? Yes. No, no. In a scattering amplitude, the various resonances are different particles. Because the location of the resonance tells you the mass of the resonance, the energy of the resonance, which is the mass of the resonance. So the Higgs, the bump, is at uh, 126 GeV, is the mass of the Higgs. And other particles are at other masses. And, uh, so the energies of these resonances are related to the mass of the, of the resonances. <clears throat> okay. So this is the, the physical picture. And now, we ask the basic, uh, now we go to the basic question that we want to ask is, what is the space of these S matrices? Now we know them, it's in these cartoons, what is the space? What can they be? Right. Now we don't want to do example by example. We, are, we, are, we understood, good, it's good enough. We know the essential singularities, we know the poles, the zeros. We ask now what's the space? What are these functions? Right. And that's what we will do now till the end of the lectures. Okay. So the first thing I will do from now till the end, and uh, we will always do this, is relax the condition that absolute value of s equal to 1 and replace it by absolute value of x smaller or equal than 1. So we will always do that in the real line, we will have absolute value of x smaller or equal than 1. There are two reasons for doing this. One reason is physical, one is mathematical. The physical reason is that we could say, it's good to say it's smaller than one because maybe there are other outcomes and we are being less strict, so we are describing maybe more things. The main reason is mathematical, though, is the fact that it's, much, it's easier to study this space, which is bigger, and then the boundary of this space is the one which has s equal to one. Why is this space easier to study? Because this space has an important mathematical property, which is it's a convex space. So if you have a ball, a ball is a convex space. Two points, if you connect them, it's, they are also, all the points that connect them are also in the ball. But an annulus, like a ring, is not a convex space, right? You take two points, you connect them, and you are outside the ring. In particular, S equal to 1 is not convex, right? If you connect two points, you are outside the condition. So, but if you say S equal to 1 is the boundary of a convex space, you, in mathematics it often helps you, because convex spaces are easier to study. Right? If you have a convex space, you take two points, you say immediately what the line is also inside the space, take two points, the line is inside, the space is easier to study, and then if you only care about the boundary, okay, at the end you study the boundary of that space. Okay, so that's the mathematical reason. So this defines a convex uh, space whose boundary is, uh, will be the cases where s equal to 1 but by studying this condition, one, we get a convex space, and two, we allow for other outcomes. We will see that even though we impose this condition, in practice, we will saturate this equality, so it's, it's going to be okay. But mathematically, we will impose this as an inequality. Okay. So here, you see that we have a function that takes value in a domain. So we have a function, S of k. So this function is, strictly speaking, metamorphic. Remember what's the difference between metamorphic and holomorphic? 
I always forget. I always say it's holomorphic. <laughs> For me, all functions are holomorphic. But meromorphic means holomorphic, but uh, with poles. You can have a few singularities there. Okay? But okay, locally, it's holomorphic. It's the same. It's just a function of one variable. So, so the function is meromorphic, which is just a usual holomorphic function with some poles for us. And it's a function in a domain R. For us, R is the upper half plane. And, and now we are going to say, and there is a boundary of this domain. <clears throat> and now here we have to be careful. What is the boundary of the upper half plane? It is, is it the real line, the boundary of the upper half plane? Almost always yes. When would it not be the real line? So let's see. No, no, no. Uh, so the boundary of the upper half plane, we say it's the real line, but what about the infinity? We say infinity is just a point, right? So it doesn't matter, it's just one point. But here we have to be careful. It is just a point if there's no essential singularity. If there's no essential singularity, it doesn't matter where you approach, it's the same thing. Then you can say infinity is just a point, so it's, it's the end of the real line. Right? If there is an essential singularity, infinity is not a, a line. It's a, it has the topology of a segment, right? Because it depends where you approach it. Right? So now we have to be careful. But it's okay, because remember that here we would say that this is the upper half plane, and the boundary it's fine to say it's the real line. Here we would say the domain is the upper half plane. And the boundary is not just the real line because there is this essential singularity. Okay? But okay, so what we are going to do is say S hat, where S hat of k is going to be defined as S of k divided by e to the minus 2 i k a. So this has no essential singularities. For the cases A and B, let's first study this A and B first. And now we say that this S hat is meromorphic, and there is a boundary of this domain, which is, as you said, the real line. Again, this is important, there is no boundary condition. And at the boundary, so it's a function that is bounded at the boundary. At the boundary, the absolute value of s is smaller or equal than 1 at the boundary of my domain. OK, so this is the math. We are dealing with meromorphic functions in some domain where the functions are bounded at the boundary of the domain. And this is good news because there are very powerful mathematical results that we can use to deal with bounded functions. Okay? And that's what we are going to draw next. And now I will, so and the first one, and actually it's maybe the only one we'll introduce in this course, goes by the name of the maximum modulus principle. And the maximum modulus principle Sorry? S is not bounded, the, the S matrix. The, the S matrix, this S hat, which is equal to S in the case A, and it's equal to S up to a phase in case B, is bounded at the boundary of the disk. At the boundary, but not in the whole of the S plane. Good. So let's see. So le let's, let's think of this maximum modulus principle. The maximum modulus principle says, if you have a function s of k which is holomorphic, and now 
It's important, holomorphic, so no poles. Okay, so it's already, you could already be worried that our S matrix in, can have poles, but it might not have poles. Right, sometimes you don't have poles. So let's start with the case without poles. If S of K is holomorphic in some domain R, and absolute value of S, okay, if S is holomorphic in R, it then the absolute value of S has no maximum in R. So the maximum is at the boundary of R always. Said differently, holomorphic functions don't have maxima. The holomorphic functions only have, uh, don't have maxima. They can have at most settled points. Okay? So this is a simple mathematical statement. How do we establish it, right? So this is equivalent to saying holomorphic functions have no local maxima. If it has a boundary by definition, yeah, okay. And what do you mean by bounded? Is the upper half plane a bounded or not? Compact. Mm, compact depends on what metric you put in. No, the, the answer is no. If you have a well-defined boundary, the, 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 this is still true. No, it doesn't need to be bounded. Okay, so how do we establish this? So we are saying that if you have some domain, Right? Any domain, it can be the profit, whatever. It, the, you cannot have a point where the absolute value of S is maximum there. This doesn't exist. How do you establish this? So in the notes, I give you a bunch of proofs of this uh, simple theorem. It's called the maximum modulus principle. The simplest one um, is just by brute force. You imagine there exists a point which is a maximum. And you just expand the function around that point. So you write the function s is equal to s star plus z minus z star to some power. It can be 2, 4, whatever, right? Some power. Let's imagine it's 2. So you write s equal s star plus z minus z star squared, or minus z minus z star squared. Then it looks like there is a maximum. But that's in one direction. In one direction, it's a maximum. But if you go in the i direction, perpendicular, now it's a minimum, right? Because if you write x squared, if you plug x to be i z, it becomes minus x squared. Right? And so you can see it for any power, <laughs> there's always some direction where you flip the sign. You just choose the ray correctly. And so you try to expand around the point to look for a maximum, but then there were some lines where it's actually a minima, and uh, you just realize there is no maximum. Right? So the, there's no power. It doesn't matter if the power is 2. If the power is 2, it's a maxima here and it's a minima here. If the power is 4, it's a maxima here and here and it's a minima in the other directions. If the power is 6, the same. So you cannot find any power where it would work. Okay? That's the simple, I mean, that's the more pedestrian proof. Then the slightly more sophisticated proof. The slightly more sophisticated proof says that an holomorphic function at the point is equal to the average of the neighbors. Why is that true? One way of seeing is the residue theorem that Ricardo used already in his lectures. That if you have a function, S at some point K, it's equal to the contour integral of S of W divided by K minus W dW. And if you make a small circle around, K equal, uh, around W equal K, that becomes just the average of the function as I go around. Right? Do you agree? And so if a function is equal to the average of the neighbors, it can never be the biggest. Right? If you are as rich as the people around, you cannot be the richest. Right? 
And so functions cannot have maxima because a function locally is the average of the neighbors. And so that's an, a slightly more sophisticated way of saying. The nicest one for me, I find the, the, the cutest derivation, is to consider the function logarithm of the S matrix, logarithm of the function. If you take, if you consider logarithm of a function, of some function f, this is logarithm of the absolute value of the function f plus i argument of the function f, right? So this function is holomorphic, and uh, this is a, a function of z. So this is the real part, this is the imaginary part, right? And you know that the real and imaginary part of a function of z uh, obey uh, the diffusion equation, right? So you can think of them that this function log of f is like the stationary state of the heat equation. Right? So having a maximum would be like saying that I have a two-dimensional oven and there is a point which is the hottest inside. Right? But that cannot be. If it's the hottest temperature will diffuse. So in a two-dimensional oven, the walls are always the hottest uh, places right? because of diffusion. Okay, that's a more sophisticated argument. But uh, it's cute that uh, you can have this simple physical intuition and get to the same result. Okay, good. So, so we have this statement that if our function is, if you have an holomorphic function, then uh, the function, uh, the maxima of the function is at R. And so now we could start trying to apply this technology to our S matrices. So let's start asking some question about some S matrices. So let's say, let's start asking our problem, bootstrap problem number one. Suppose I have an S matrix, S of K, without bound states. for case of type A, where there is no essential singularity at infinity. Right? OK? Then let's consider S at some value, I kappa. Now, S at I kappa is real, always. Right? Why? Because we said there was a, a, ref, a conjugation symmetry around k and minus k starts. So in the imaginary axis, the S matrices are always real. So this is a real number, right? There was a symmetry around the reflection around the imaginary axis, right? Remember that S here is the conjugate of S here. So S in the middle is real. So this is a real number, right? So this we define as alpha. And we ask, what is, say, the maximum number, the maximum value alpha can take? That's a way of parameterizing our S matrix. So we take one aspect of the S matrix, the value at some imaginary point, and we ask how big can it be for any S matrix? Right? OK, so that's a first problem we could solve, trying to use this th mathematical theorem. Well, the function is holomorphic. It has no bound states, so it's an holomorphic function. It can have a bunch of zeros, perhaps, but there's no poles because there are no bound states. There's no essential singularity, so we know the boundary. And so we have a function in the upper half plane. That is smaller or equal than 1 at the boundary. And then we want to ask, what is the value of the function here? Right? But the function has no maxima. Right? So the function being bounded at the boundary implies that S is smaller or equal than 1 
in the full upper half plane. Right? Because if it's one at the boundary, and if the maximum must be, at, if it's smaller than one at the boundary, and the maximum can only be attained at the boundary, the function is smaller than one everywhere. So an holomorphic function that is bounded at the boundary, it's bounded immediately inside. It cannot, uh, you cannot have a function that is smaller than one at the boundary and it's two inside. That doesn't exist. Right? Okay, so we are done. So in particular, if I go to this value, i kappa, where the function is real, I conclude that s to the i kappa is smaller or equal than 1. And what function would saturate this bound? What S matrix would saturate this bound? How do I get a function of k that is equal to 1 at ik? What function could it be? Okay, so this right, of the one and S of i k equal to one, if and only if S of k equal to one. Right? Because if the function is one at uh, in some point. Right? which is equal to what it can be at the boundary, then it better be constant everywhere. Right? Otherwise, it would be a, we would reach a contradiction. But why can't it be one half on everywhere but the boundary? No, one half is smaller than one. Yeah, so we should be good. Yeah, we are good. One, is smaller, uh, one half is smaller than one, that's true. If and only if. No, s is equal to 1 if and only if s is equal to, to 1. That's the only holomorphic function. You want a function that is a distribution, that is 1 half and then it's 1? Well, I mean, we spent all these lectures to show that s is an holomorphic function with derivatives, poles, etc. The last thing we want to do is start sure. saying s is a distribution. Yeah? Uh, so the absolute value is smaller or equal than 1 in the real line, yes. right? So uh, the function inside can never be bigger than 1. Do you agree? That's all we are using. So I guess you are asking, suppose we knew that the function was smaller than 1 in the... Okay, so... Uh, this is a parenthesis, it's not related to this physical problem, but we could have a function, for example, that is smaller or equal to one half here and smaller or equal to one here, right? And then we ask, what's the maximum of the function here? Right? That's a more subtle problem. You can try to solve it. If you fail, you can ask me, I can, I can show you. It's a hard problem. This is a harder problem. It has a solution, but it's a, it's a little bit more complicated. But it's the kind of problem that you, you, you can also solve. But it, we will solve other complicated problems, so we'll have enough complicated problems. So let's start with the easy ones, and this is a toy problem that we could indeed satisfy. But here, you see, a priori, you know the function here, Cannot be, uh, uh, cannot be bigger than one, but it can be bigger than one half. That would uh, be okay. There's no contradiction, right? So, good. And so we find that this space of S matrices, if you parameterize the space by this alpha, it's one coordinate in the space of S matrices, and then the boundary is at alpha equal to 1, where we reach 
one S matrix that is at that boundary, which is the S matrix S equal to one. And that, that's nice, that's a very physical theory. What is the theory that has S equal to one? It's just the free theory, right? The free theory of the, so this is just the free boson. It's kind of a boring theory, but okay, fine. <laughs> at the boundary psh, lies the free theory. Then you go inside and you have the interacting theories. Okay, so this would be a first uh, problem we could uh, solve. Let's go now and ask for a more interesting problem. Just a second, let me see if I'm... Uh, uh, uh. Yeah, there are a bunch of fun problems for you to solve. Okay, yeah? Sorry, it's not possible to, this is a function of k. The constant function is the constant function. Oh, so it's not? This is s of k equal to one for any k, right? Oh, okay. Not for real k, and not for, I mean, it's, it's just the function one, the constant function, right? For any k that you scatter, s is equal to one, just a free theory. The particles just pass by each other, and because they are bosons, s is equal to one, and that's it. Okay. So that was our bootstrap problem one. And you would say, okay, but we suffered so much to learn about bound states and now we throw bound states away. Okay, but that, we don't need to. Let's solve something with bound states now. Let's ask, I have a theory with one bound state. So let's go to problem bootstrap problem number two. Okay, so bootstrap problem number two. Let's suppose we have S of K with one bound state at K equal I kappa. Let's still stay, let's still say it's of type A. And it has with a coupling, let's, in, let's stress this notion of coupling to the bound state. G square, where G square we define as S of K, close the bound state is I, K minus I kappa, with a G square up here. Remember that this was positive. So it's a good idea to call it G square. Right? G square is positive. And so this G square measures the coupling to this bound state. And now we ask G square, what's the space? So we know it is positive, And we want to know what sits here. How big can this coupling be? If you have a theory with a single bound state, what is the answer to this? Okay, so today we will not solve anything with dragons, so I'll erase the dragons. Tomorrow, or rather on Friday in my last lecture, we will solve one problem with dragons. Dragons are really tough. There's not much I know how to solve with dragons, but okay. we'll solve one problem. But for now, today we'll stay with bootstrap problems of type A and B. And now let's continue here. And so how would we solve this problem? Now, this function is not bounded, of course, in the upper half plane, it has a pole. Right? At the pole, I mean, close to the pole, it's a million, right? I mean, the function is not bounded. Another way of saying is that the function, the boundary of the domain, if I think, what would be the natural, natural boundary of this domain? You could say the boundary is the real line plus a small circle around the pole. If you want, you exclude a small circle. Now you have a function that is meromorphic in this domain. But okay, but it's not bounded in this boundary. It's bounded only in this one. 
So now it's not bounded in the full boundary, and therefore we cannot use the theorem. Right? So the function is bounded here, but it's not bounded here. OK, so we have to think a little bit. So how can we solve this problem? Any, any suggestion from those that did not read the notes yet? So how, if you have a function that has a singularity and you would like it not to have a singularity, what do you do? You could exclude some region. That, is, that has this problem that I discussed there. That uh, now that the boundary of that region, things are not bounded, so it's a bit tricky. We do an expansion. Uh, where? We could do an expansion around the pole, but that we did already. I did it here. I get this. Plus dot, dot, dot. Fine. That's how we define g squared. But we want to know how big can this g squared be? Very good. Good idea. So what's your name? Mateusz suggests if we have a pole, let's multiply by that pole. Now we don't have a pole. Right? OK, so that was a chip. But OK, if it works, why not? So let's consider S of k. And let's multiply by k minus i kappa. Now this function that uh, I define as f of k, this function now is holomorphic inside uh, in the upper half plane. But what did I screw up? Now in the real line, uh, it's not bounded anymore. Right? Because this one is smaller or equal than 1, and I multiply by this factor that is not bounded anymore. How could we fix this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You divide by k plus i kappa. Notice something nice about this procedure. Now, this factor here, this factor here is a phase for k real. That's great, right? When k is real, this is a phase. It has absolute value equal to 1, right? And therefore, f is smaller or equal than 1 for k real, right? like s was. Right? Now we remove the pole, but we could be worried that we introduce the new pole. But why is this OK? Because in the lower half plane. All right? And so it has, it's a phase, and it has a pole in the lower half plane. So that's OK. And it removes the pole in the upper half plane. So f is bounded and holomorphic. We solved both problems. Right? So this function f now is smaller or equal than 1 everywhere. Right? f now is smaller or equal than 1 at the boundary. There's no singularity in the domain, so it's smaller or equal than 1 everywhere. Right? And so we conclude. that f of k is smaller or equal than 1 in the upper half plane. Or rather, the absolute value of f of k is smaller or equal than 1 in the upper half plane. Right? And what is f of i kappa? Well, f of i kappa, you see that when k is close to i kappa, i s is given by that expression there, right? Close to i kappa. So there, at i kappa, this function is equal to i g square, then that factor cancels with this factor, divided by 2 i kappa. Do you agree? 
And so the i's cancel. We get something real, as it should be. And this needs to be smaller or equal than 1. Right? And, though, and so we conclude that g squared is smaller or equal than 2 kappa. Okay. And so the space of theories, our space of theories with a single pole, now we have a more interesting solution. If we plot g square, here is 0, and here is 2 kappa. Well, let me maybe plot 2 kappa here. And then the claim is that this region here is possible, is allowed. And this region here is forbidden. So this is the first example of the space of theories. There is a segment. This is where the physics lives. And then there is the outside, which is excluded. Right? OK, this is excluded also, but in a more trivial way. Right? So this is forbidden as well. And this would be the allowed values of the coupling. Yes, the coupling defined as the residue, the way the external particles couple to the bound state. If you ask me, how is this coupling related to other things? I would say, okay, you would have to compute. But this is a very physical definition of the coupling. It's really, you go at the physical object, like the S matrix. You measure the residue, which is like the way it couples, the particles couple. And that gives you a very physical definition of the, of the coupling. Right? Now, this coupling, of course, is related to the parameters of the fundamental theory in some way. And you might want to work it out, but that depends on the theory. OK. So this is the space of theories. And like before, we could ask, what theories saturate the bound? Right? What theories lie at the boundary? So what theories saturate the bound? Zero? Well, many theories. right? all theories that don't have bound states. If I put a coupling g equals 0, all possible theories that don't have bound states saturate that point. So that point is a, is a quark. That point is, there's lots of theories there. And what about what theory saturate is bound on this direction? g squared equal to 2 kappa. When can g squared be equal to 2 kappa? Which is the statement that when can this f be equal to 1? Right? f is smaller or equal than 1. If it's 1 at the point, what does it mean? It's constant, like we saw before. So if we saturate this bound, here we get equal if and only if, like we saw before, this f of k equal to 1. Right? But if f equal to 1, what is s? It's just the inverse of this factor here, right? And so that means that at this boundary, the S matrix S of k is equal to k plus i kappa over k minus i kappa. What theory is this S matrix? The delta function potential. So we found that the delta function, but it's not any theory. It's the theory. It's the theory with the strongest coupling. There is a, any other theory you consider that only has one bound state will have a weaker coupling. So the delta function potential is the theory that creates the strongest coupled bound state. Right? So the theory we found is the delta function. Of all these ultra-local theories, that's nothing but the delta function as matrix that we found before. In the remaining two minutes, 
because it's very easy. Let's solve another bootstrap problem related to this one, which would be the same problem for case B. Single bound state, same question. What's the allowed value of the coupling? What's the answer? So let me draw here 0, 2 kappa. This was the allowed region before. But now we are in case B. So how would this change? What would change if you go to case B? Sorry? We have to have only one pole. We only have one pole. Right? We are in this case. Right? So we have an essential singularity. So what should we change? So here, this function, if I define it like this, it's not good. Do you agree? Because it has an essential singularity at infinity. So what should I do to the, in this definition of f to make it good? Right. So just put the head here, right? Now it's good. Do you agree? But now, what is f of ik? Is it equal to this? No, there's no exponential. No, because now there is an exponential, because s is s, s hat is s divided by whatever, right? So now, there is an extra e to the 2 uh, kappa a. Right? Do you agree? If we put all the factors correctly, there is this extra factor which is bigger or equal than one. And so the new bound is this. It's here. It's 2 kappa e to the 2 kappa a. So that's the allowed region for case b. So we can have b. We, it's a loser bound, right? Because we allow for b more potential, so the bound now, the space is bigger. Right? So if you tell me you have a single bound state, right, and you measure the coupling experimentally, and you get a coupling here, you know the potential has finite range, for sure. Because with ultra-local potential, it could never happen, right? And if you measure a coupling here, you know your experiment is a problem. <laughs> right? You did the wrong experiment. Or uh, some condition that you thought was true is violated, and then it makes you revisit your assumptions. Right? So this is now the allowed space. So now we get this bigger allowed space. Next time, we'll consider the following two problems, the following class of problems. So let me just tell you the problems we are going to consider. One type of problems would be, how do this change if we know there are resonances, right? We measure the Higgs, and we say, oh, at 126 GV, there is the Higgs. Okay, so then now I put the Higgs, right? I put this resonance. Now I want to say, what's the space of theories that have one stable bound state plus one resonance? How big can the coupling be? That's, that's still easy. Then we'll go a bit harder and we'll ask, suppose we have two bound states. How do we start studying these problems with more bound states? And maybe bound states, more than, and again, any number of bound states and, and resonances. That's more subtle. And then we could ask, what if I have, for example, just one bound state, but I, if I'm in case C, where there are these dragons? And that is the very last problem we are going to solve. That's the, the hardest one. And, uh, and this gives you a flavor of the type of problems, which is about exploring not a particular theory, but the space of theories. So far, we found that at the boundary, we recognize theories that we saw before. Well, because I chose <laughs> those examples. Uh, we will also find examples where the S matrices that are at the boundary are different S matrices that we did not encounter yet before. But fine, they are what they are. And this philosophy of carving out the space and putting more and more conditions 
to try to look for features of this space is what the bootstrap is. Right? It's trying not to compute the S matrix, but to impose more and more known things to try to shrink and know more and more about the space uh, of, of S matrices. Right? So here will be an example. If you input this bound, you get this. Then you know it's actually ultra local. You get a, sh a shorter region. Then you know there is a resonance. It will be even shorter. Then uh, you know uh, you start imposing more things, and you could eventually try to carve out a smaller and smaller space. Okay, but uh, let's move then now to the to the question period. Yeah. So the question of uh, Mateusz is. If I have more bound states, I can now it's trivial, right? You just put a bunch of factors. Right? Yeah, th that is going to be the first thing we are going to start. Then I'll ask you, is this good? And I'll ask you, why is this bad? That will be the second question oh, we will do. <laughs> That's going to be done tomorrow, yeah. Uh, it's related with the question. Uh, when I have more bound states, we will have more uh, dimensions in the space of a lot of theories, because uh, we see that in the first case we have just uh, one theory, the free theory. It's uh, just a point. Yeah. Now we have a line, and I think... No, but even in the free theory, we, could have, we would have a line. It would be S needs to be between minus one and one, if you have no poles. And okay. that's the allowed space of S's. So it's uh, still a line. But that's because we chose one line to study, which was one coordinate of the space of S matrices, which was the value of the S matrix at some point. If we study more coordinates, like we ask, what's the space of, for example, we could ask the function and the derivative of the function. Right? And now we have a two-dimensional space. So it's up to us to choose what coordinates we use. We have to, it's better to choose the more physical, the better, right? Couplings is a very nice one because there's a physical meaning. Values at random points and derivatives, it's also okay, because if there are special features of the space, by studying some sections, you might still find it. But uh, the true space is infinite dimensional. It's the space of functions, right? Okay. So you pick whatever axes you want to pick in this infinite dimensional space, and you are studying sections of that infinite dimensional space. Yeah, I have a question about the resonance and particles. What we began doing on Monday, you said we were scattering particles, so we were throwing two particles and then measuring <coughs> stuff. How can this relate to the resonance producing particles? Uh, so all we are doing in this course is sending particles and receiving particles. Yeah. Now, when there is a resonance, like an, a, a something that's almost a bound state, what happens is that you send the particles in and they will spend lots of time in the box because they, they, they almost form a bound state. But it's not really a bound state because uh, it's not. It has a very long lifetime. Eventually it gets out and we measure it. Right? Yeah. But we do see a bump. And the bump is the particle spending lots of time there. Okay. And uh, that's how we detect that there was a particle there. How do we interpret what was going on physically? Physically, we draw these pictures like Jun Wu was drawing. The two particles go, they form a resonance, boom, 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 and then the resonance decay, leaves the box, which is decay. Okay, so so they, that's an interpretation of the picture. We just say the particles come in, then they form this resonance, and then the resonance decays again. That's the cartoon that describes what I just said. Particles go in, stay in the box, and then they leak out. This is what's called the Feynman diagram. It describes these particles going in, forming this particle, and decaying. There's a question there. I'll ask you a question. Like, what, what happens to like a, a pose with like an order higher than one? So poles of order higher than one uh, cannot exist uh, in, uh, non, I think, in non-relativistic S matrices. In relativistic S matrices, they can exist and tip, and we can also try to put bounds on on, on them. But uh, I think in non-relativistic S matrices, all we can have is uh, single poles. Yeah. 
Is there like a physical reason for that? <sighs> What's the physical reason? I don't see right away, but uh, I can give a short, uh, I don't think it's a very satisfactory answer, but uh, so if you have a process like this, uh, where uh, you have this loop diagram where the particle splits into two and so on, and then you try to study the singularity associated to a process like this, if you, are in, if you have a loop integration here, L, which is two-dimensional, and you put these guys on shell, pong, pong, pong. you have three delta functions and you have two integrations. So in total, the discontinuity, if you count delta functions and uh, integrations, you find that in this type of diagrams, you can get higher order poles. And the point is that um, this type of diagrams, this type of loops that you need to get higher order poles, uh, in non-relativistic theories, they don't exist. Everything that exists are bubbles and stuff because you don't have antiparticles. So you don't have honest stuff where some particles are going to the past and some going to the future. Some lines are collapsed and all you have are bubbles. And uh, therefore, all the type of processes you have that you would have in non-relativistic theories where you could have particles moving to the past and to the future, they get collapsed and you're going to get bubbles and bubbles only produce single poles. But that's a very perturbative argument. I don't, I would have to think a little bit more. But, uh, yeah. Thanks. Uh, yeah. But you also have that equation that was the derivative of the S matrix divided by this square equal to a positive part. That equation, that equation also tells you that you only have simple poles, right? Because otherwise if you have a high order pole, Good point, good point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that's, also, that's also good. As Siddhartha points out, yes. We have an equation for S prime over S square equals something, and S prime over S square would blow up if it's a higher order pole, and it's constant for a single order pole. That's a cleaner answer, yeah. Better, much better. Thanks. Good point. Did people get it? Right? We had an equation. S prime over S square equal blah, 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 blah. Right? It was how we used to show that residue was positive. Right? It was an equation. S prime over S square equal plus a bunch of terms that we could ignore equal to something. Right? But for that equation to make sense, if S prime over S square, if there was a higher order pole, that term would explode. And uh, now we could not make sense of the equation. And so it can have single poles, but not more. So in the, in the notes, so I, I because I, I, I do want to spend a little bit, uh, I want to do these examples that I said I'm going to do tomorrow very calmly. Uh, I jumped several examples in the notes that you are encouraged to, to have a look if you want, where I have many problems to type problems like this ones for when the, bound, when the domain is just the unit disk and the boundary is just the boundary of the unit disk. And then you can ask uh, how big can the function be in the origin, etc. And uh, you can have some fun solving these problems. You can also ask questions about some of the problems if you have. Huh? We have five minutes. Is there any relation between the zeros, uh, the resonance, and I, I don't know, propagators of particles? Um, there is. Uh, but uh, I would rather not go there because, I mean, uh, 
most people don't know what a propagator is. It's a bit out of the scope. Uh, it would oblige me to use some language that. Yeah. Uh, so, close to a resonance, when you have a resonance, this matrix close to the resonance behaves like this. K, and here K, and now there is a pole in the row half plane and a zero in the upper half plane. So it's something like K minus, and then there is a pole in the lower half plane, so minus I kappa, and here, there is a zero, so at uh, some um, i kappa, and then some real part, plus some uh, kappa real, plus some kappa real. And um, so this imaginary part is related to the lifetime of the resonance. And this real part is related to the energy of the resonance, or the mass of the resonance. And so in quantum field theory, often what happens is that this resonance starts its life as a stable particle, and the propagator is just 1 over k minus kr. And it looks like a propagator pole. But then, as you sum Feynman diagrams, you re-sum Feynman diagrams, and you recognize that that pole that looks like just a propagator pole, 1 over k minus kr. Actually, the next term is something like i kappa 1 over k minus kr square, when you start doing Feynman diagrams, plus dot, dot, dot. And this resums into something that actually has no pole in the real line. It couldn't, because it was bounded, so it cannot have poles in the real line. But actually, it resums into something like this, some geometric series where kappa becomes just a lifetime. And so, so yes, there is, if the, if the particle, if kappa is small, you recognize right away that that's just a propagator for a resonance of some given mass. And this imaginary part, typically, doesn't come at uh, three level. It never comes at three level. It comes not from a single propagator, but from a resummation that tells you that this propagator is actually unstable and there is an imaginary part. And that pole, that in perturbation theory starts in the real line, is pushed to the imaginary axis. That was the same in quantum mechanics. If we start with double well, with mu huge, we got that k was real. It was this alpha integer case. And then if we do a perturbation theory in one over mu, which you could develop some Feynman diagrams for it, that perturbation theory kicks the poles to the lower half plane and says, no, 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 it's not exactly k alpha integer. It's k alpha integer minus a small imaginary part. And you could draw some propagator diagrammatics for that mu, one over mu expansion if you wanted, and you would see that nicely. Thank you. Uh, if we have a lot of if the S matrix was in tensorial form, it, how we could fix this pose? If the, if the S matrix, uh, if the S matrix uh, were an honest matrix instead of... Yes, uh, yes. So you could ask even, uh, right. So then you could ask, is there a version so then you can think that uh, you have a matrix version of this uh, statement, that the function is bounded in matrix form. And you could ask, is there some kind of maximum modulus principle, not for functions, but for matrices, right? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. So there are some, some theorems can be generalized, some cannot. And when they cannot, you could ask, how could you go on, right? Because here we could solve things analytically. So maybe another way of asking your question is, could we do this numerically so that we can generalize it to more complicated cases? That's something I'm going to explain tomorrow. So, so, so far, 
we came up with clever tricks. We saw, oh, let, let's do this, multiply by this factor. But you could ask, how could I solve these problems numerically? Because then I could solve more complicated problems, like when I have particles of different types and uh, I just have more inequalities, because some of those cases can only be done numerically. So it's not always true that you can just use some nice theorems in complex analysis and solve things uh, analytically. Especially when you go to higher dimensions, when things will no longer be just a function of one variable, the energy, but they will also depend on the angle of scattering, for example. And now, functions of two variables, they are not twice as complicated as functions of one variable. Functions of two variables is much more complicated than functions of one variable, and there you really need numerics. And with, if we had multiple poles, we done this trick a lot of times, like this? Now that's what already uh, Matthias asked. Uh, uh, if I have two poles, why can't I just multiply this by two factors and, uh, and that's it? And uh, it almost, it, it looks easy, right? What could go wrong? Uh, can, <laughs> since people are asking me this question a lot. So why wouldn't I be able to just multiply? So what could go wrong? Let's try to see. One, is it holomorphic? If I multiply by two poles, did I make the function holomorphic or not yet? What do you think? Am I good? Is it holomorphic or, uh, or not? Who thinks it's holomorphic? Who thinks it's not yet holomorphic? If... Why do you think it's not yet holomorphic? One of the poles, but not both simultaneously. But if this function has two poles, I multiply by two things like this. Now, if I go close to one pole, it's zero. I go close to the other pole, there's another zero. So I don't no longer have a pole. So it's holomorphic. That's good. Holomorphic is good. Uh, did I introduce poles in the upper half plane by putting two factors like this? No. Big, right? I mean, that's part of the, of the previous question, right? Because they would both be in the lower half plane, so that's also good. Bounded. Is the function still bounded if I multiply by two such factors? Who thinks no? Who thinks yes? Well, yes, it is, right? Because each of them is a phase for real case, so the product of two is still a phase. So my function is bounded, it's holomorphic, uh, the value of the function at i kappa, is it going to be related to one of the residues of the poles? And at the, val the other point, i kappa prime, is it going to be related to the other residue? Yes. Right? You would have two couplings, one for one pole, we can call it g square, one for the other pole, we can call it g prime square. We measure one at i kappa, we measure the other at i kappa prime, that's still okay. Right? But there's still something wrong. Okay, I'll give the spoiler. The spoiler is that in doing this, and then you study one of the bound states, you are not making sure that the residue of the other one is positive. And that's crucial. All the residues need to, to be positive. So you need to be careful that if you just divide by the poles and you start studying the space, you would conclude the space is bigger than the correct physical space because it will have some non-unitary poles. So the one you maximize is going to be a very big positive number, but then you look at the other one and the other one is minus seven, say. And that's excluded. Now you need to fix that minus seven and uh, make it positive and now the bound will go down. Yeah. But we'll do it in steps. Well, okay, now, uh, uh, but uh, that, that's the caveat. We, we need to be careful that uh, all the poles need to be positive, and uh, that's really crucial. Right. The reason is, is, is like uh, this invisibility cloaks. If you have things that are uh, opposite sign, they screen each other, right? like Harry Potter and this invisibility stuff. Right? That's exactly how it works. And uh, so you have a, a very big pole and nearby you have a negative pole with opposite residue, right? You can cancel the poles. Then, of course, the residue can be huge because there's someone else with negative residue nearby canceling it, right? And so, but if both have positive residue, then they cannot screen each other and now you get a strong bond. 
So we need to, uh, so that will be the subtlety. That's why it will take us like 20 minutes to, to study that case. No. Maybe a bit less, because now we already spoke so much about that example. <laughs> that is going to be faster. Okay, I think it's a good time to go for lunch. Okay. <laughs>